Welcome to the Profiling Evil podcast. I'm Mike King, and during my law enforcement career, I investigated some of the most complex crimes imaginable. Now I use that experience to explore true crime in a way that's compelling and captivating. In this episode, we'll be looking at spree killers, and I'm joined by retired FBI profiler Mark Safrick. Let's get started. Well, today I invited my longtime friend, retired supervisory special agent Mark Safrick, to talk about spree killers. He's an expert in this area, and he has a new book out titled Spree Killers, Practical Classifications for Law Enforcement and Criminology. The book is co-authored by Catherine Ramsland, and I hope that you're going to order it online at the conclusion of our interview. You can go to any of the outlets to get it. So, Mark, welcome to the show. Thanks, Mike. Yeah, it's been a long time, but yeah, we have a long history going back to the days of uh, Boston College and and uh, Dr. Burgess and yeah. just all of all of the friends that we have been fortunate to work along. Do you mind if I just tell people a little bit about you to kind of set the stage? Sure, absolutely. Great. Well, f- folks, Mark Safrick is one of the most respected members of the FBI's Federal Bureau of Investigation Elite Behavioral Analysis Unit. His career spans more than 30 years, including, this is the part that I really like, work as a street cop and a detective before joining the Bureau. To me, that's always been really important, and I think a complementary part of his career. Uh, More than half of his career was spent in the halls of the profiling unit, where he became an internationally recognized expert in violent criminal behavior. He's a graduate and a grad, has a graduate degree from Boston College, where he also serves as an adjunct faculty member. I, I reached out to you a couple of years ago when you were uh, starting up your stuff in, in uh, Europe because actually one of, the, one of my friends, a commander in the Norwegian police, uh, reached out to me and, and he, uh, he, he said, hey, do you know this guy? He says, we're, we love him. And I thought that was so fun to be able to, well, and, and it's also kind of, um, pop culture to be able to say, I know you. So that's oh, really yeah, fun. Right. But you know, it was, I, I did go over to Scandinavia. Oh, some years ago, um, quite a few years ago, I actually was in the bureau at the time. Um, and we had the profilers from Norway, Denmark, Sweden, and Finland, the, the guys in their investigative units who were doing that kind of work went over and did a week's worth of, um, you know, uh, presentations and lectures and training, and just had a great time. So I, I know a lot of those guys over there. And of course, I did two seasons in Sweden and two seasons in Denmark. So, and I'm half Norwegian myself. So <laughs> I'm very familiar with the Scandinavia. And I've been over there a bunch of times. That, that is such a neat area. I um, Sometime we're going to have to get back on and talk about just how amazing law enforcement is over there and the challenges they face uh, with things like their feeling about social media, I mean, we, we get away with things in the state in looking at social media and things that they just wouldn't even attempt to try. Uh, but that would be really fun to talk about some of those challenges they face compared to what we do in America. Yeah, plus, they, you know, you're working with national police forces, which is different than we have here. You know, we have 17,000 plus law enforcement agencies. So when you're trying to coordinate, uh, you know, uh, a serial offender over there, whether it's homicide or sexual assault, you're working with one agency. So it tends to tends to go smoother than when you're over here and you're working in a task force environment. Yeah, great, great point. Well, let's let's dig into this topic of spree killers. Uh, the classification of this kind of offender, in my opinion, is really long overdue. Can you take a moment and kind of fill everybody in on this particular kind of predator, but also what makes them so unique? Sure. So I, I think it's important to get a little background. You know, it, it, my partner, Bob Ressler, coined the term serial killer in 1977. So that terminology has not really been around for that long a period of time. Of course, we had serial killers prior to that, um, but we didn't really, you know, we didn't talk about them in that in those terms. Um, the FBI was really the first agency to define serial murder and mass murder and spree murder. And, and the definitions are important in how this whole process developed. So initially, 
we define serial murder as three or more murders in three or more locations uh, with a cooling off period. And the cooling off period was important because that was that temporal or time separation that existed between homicides. And then we categorized uh, mass murder as four or more murders in one location as one event. And then spree murder essentially falls in between serial and mass. And it can slide towards serial depending on the dynamics of the crime or it can slide towards mass. And at the time, uh, we defined spree as two or more murders in two or more locations. So the difference between serial and spree had to do with this temporal or cooling off period, which is not a good term. I mean, the cooling off period is, doesn't really help us. We never really defined it, which was problematic, uh, which is why we ended up changing this, the uh, definition later on. So we ran with those definitions in the early, um, in the 70s and 80s, when we were doing a lot of research into serial killers and going into the prisons and interviewing these guys. Um, and it wasn't until 2005 when we started getting a lot of, you know, other agencies and researchers and academics were saying, you know, we really need to sort of redefine serial murder, how, how we should look at it. Well, the FBI was really the agency that could do that because we had the money to be able to put together a large conference. And that's what we did. My unit, the guys in my unit, we put together a serial murder symposium in which we invited 140 of the world's experts um, to San Antonio, Texas for four or five days. We had academics, researchers, suicidologists, psychologists, law enforcement administrators, task force commanders, um, all of these individuals having a different view of serial murder. And we got together and we discussed many aspects of serial murder, investigating the cases, how you, we define it, um, how we prosecute these cases, the mental health aspects, or the psychological dynamics in serial murder. But we came up with a definition of serial murder that basically says two or more uh, murders in two locations separated in time. Well, that definition eliminated the cooling off period. And once, once you eliminated the cooling off period, then the definition between spree and serial was essentially the same thing. So within the conference, there was a decision, a joint decision, to eliminate spree murder from the lexicon, from the FBI lexicon. We, were, we would have mass and serial, but spree would sort of get subsumed into either serial or mass, whichever it was most close to. Now, at the time, I didn't agree with that. I, I didn't think that we should eliminate spree because spree is really, you know, there are pure spree killers. And that's what really the book is about. And it, even how this came about, um, Catherine and I, I was getting ready to teach for Catherine um, back in 2018. And we were talking about this case, the Dwight Lamont Jones case out of Phoenix. And we were talking about how this guy had been identified. See, in serial murder, law enforcement is almost always behind the curve. We're, we're reactive in serial murder, responding to the killings. And in mass murder, we're, we're clearly behind the curve. Typically, by the time law enforcement responds in a mass murder, the event is over or almost over. But here was a case of spree murder where police were able to intervene and stop the offender, prevent future victims. So we were talking about this case and we thought, this is really interesting. And we recognized that the amount of research that's been done on serial murder and how many categories we've developed and, uh, is really astounding. And we've done a tremendous amount of research on mass murders and we've also categorized mass killers as well. But there's been almost no research on spree killers. We just basically still define spree killers as the Bureau had defined it. Two or more murders in two or more locations as kind of one event. But beyond that, we didn't do anything with it. 
So we thought here's an opportunity where we can take a category that's been around for a long time and, and uh, try to develop separate categories within Spree Killer, much like we've done for Serial or Mass. And the, and the Dwight Lamont Jones case was, was a case that spurred that because what happened was in June of 2018, uh, Jones killed Stephen Pitt, Dr. Stephen Pitt, a psychiatrist on the street. And Pitt was actually the guy who was the psychiatrist that had participated in the divorce trial between Jones and his, and his wife. The next day, he killed two paralegals in a law firm. Now, the paralegals weren't associated with, with Jones, but the law firm was. And then the next day, he killed a life coach in a counseling office that actually had nothing to do with the divorce. But the other woman in the office had counseled Jones. So here we had um, one psychiatrist who had been associated with the case and then the law office, and then the, um, the counseling center, but not the guys that are being killed. And so what happened was a detective, a retired detective, recognized the connection between not only people, but places as all being associated with this divorce case. Um, so you had four murders in three different locations and he put the connection together. He goes, you know, this, 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 this doctor, the locations are all connected to this divorce. I bet you I know who, this, who the killer is. It's Dwight Lamont Jones. So he notified Phoenix police. Phoenix police took a day to locate Jones. And in the meantime, he'd killed an elderly couple uh, to get a firearm from them. But they identified Jones, they found Jones, they got into uh, you know, a standoff and then Jones suicided. But when Jones is, you know, when his location was searched where he was living, he was living in a long-term motel, they found a list of individuals that Jones was gonna target, specifically this detective, former detective, his wife and others. So here's a case where law enforcement was able to intervene identify the offender and prevent future victims. So we thought, wow, if you can do this in a spree case, maybe there's categories that will lend themselves to being, um, you know, law enforcement can interact. So we started, first we defined spree killer. So we, we tried to bring back the, the definition the FBI had, but to tweak it a little bit, not too much. So we said a spree killer is an individual, it's a string of three or more murders rather than two, three or more murders in two or more, two or more locations precipitated by an event that continues to fuel the killings. And it happens in a relatively short period of time. Now, we all knew that relatively short period of time is kind of like, you know, cooling off period. It doesn't really define itself. But we needed to have some flexibility because there's cases that go over a matter of hours and cases that go over a matter of weeks. And we, we wanted to be able to actually capture the true spree killer. So we were a little, you know, we, we gave ourselves some latitude on, on that description. Then we started collecting cases. And as we collected cases, we said, okay, well, how does, where, do, where would we put this? What category could we put this into? So we started to develop categories. And our categories, you know, sometimes we mix categories together or melded them together. Other times we found like, well, we hardly have anybody in this category, but it would fit better in this category. So you see, as you start getting more and more cases, pure spree cases, um, your, your categories get better. So after like 75 cases, we were on our way to getting the number of categories we wanted. By your time you're at 200 cases, you're finding that every single new case you look at fits into one of the categories um, that you've already developed. So in the end, we had 419 killers in 359 events coming out of 43 countries. So we felt very comfortable in our categorizations. We had five primary categories of, of these killers. 
So they fell into anger, revenge, uh, mental illness, desperation, robbery, thrill, and mission-oriented killers. Those were our five primary categories. And then we have a couple of uh, secondary categories, um, movement in tight locations and then spree crossovers where you've got like serial spree or mass spree. Uh, Anders Breivik, who was the Norwegian um, killer, most people think of Anders as a mass murderer, and he is a mass murderer because he, he detonated a bomb in downtown Oslo, killing eight people, and that was a diversion so he could then dress up as a police officer, go out to the island of Utoya, and he, where he slaughtered 69 people, mostly children. So we have like two mass murders, but it really is a spree as well. So that's what I mean by like a mixed crossover spree. And then we subdivided some of those categories. So like the anger revenge category, we subdivided into three areas, targeted, targeted and opportunistic, and then opportunistic random. So the targeted would be the, the person is actually targeting specific individuals for revenge or because he's angry. In targeted random and opportunistic, he starts off with targeted victims, but then he devolves into just killing other people along the way. And then, of course, the random opportunistic is just, you know, you're just killing whoever is along your path. You don't have any designated targets. And it turns out that was actually the largest category at about 31%. And the anger revenge targeted was one of the categories that allowed law enforcement, if you know what you're looking for, to then become proactive and intervene. So out of these categories, we found out of the nine categories, the five um, primary and the four subcategories, we found three of those subcategories that actually law enforcement can be proactive in. Anger, revenge, targeted. Anger, revenge, targeted and opportunistic. And mission, non-psychotic. Because we split mission into psychotic killers like uh, Richard Trenton Chase, the vampire killer of Sacramento. Um, where, the, where there's clearly psychosis, right? So he had a mission to stop his blood from turning to powder, you know, and he was killing people and drinking their blood and bathing in blood. But those guys are really hard to predict because you don't know what's driving that, you know, that psychotic mission. And then you have non-psychotic offender mission killers like Elliot Roger, the incel. Right. So those kind of individuals post manifestos and they post videos. Uh, and if you are following that kind of information, you you see who their clear targets are. So those three areas we found law enforcement can actually intervene. And then there's other categories where law enforcement cannot intervene. I mean, you just have to do your basic great police investigation to solve the case. And one of the primary categories is robbery thrill. So it's one of our big categories. I think 22% of our offenders are in robbery kill as both loan operators and teams. Because it's, it occurs over such a wide geographic area, it's very problematic for law enforcement to know where these people are going, who they're going to target next. So if you think you've got, you know, a spree killer who's involved in robbery thrill, then the, the advice that we provide in the book isn't going to be helpful. So knowing which category, see, that's the key, because law enforcement, we never categorized spree killers before. We just describe them as spree killers. And the categories really help because once you recognize there are categories and there's ways to discern which category you're probably dealing with, maybe not after the first death, but you know, once you're two or three deaths in, you, you can, you know, uh, you can be in a position to take some proactive uh, steps. Of course, time is important because I think as I, as I, I just made a couple notes here. So 19% of our cases, occurred in less than two hours. If you are trying to deal with a case in less than two hours, 
There's no way you can intervene. Law enforcement is barely even responding within two hours. But if you get a day to three days or longer, you clearly can be in a position to intervene if you've got one of those three subcategories. And so, you know, it was, it was really interesting because as part of the research, I, there were, I read nine books that were purportedly on spree killers. What, what was interesting is when you're writing a book on spree killers, you'd think that you should probably define how you look at what a spree is for you. And in none of those books did they actually ever start off by defining spree. They just start talking about spree murder as if the reader is supposed to know what a spree murder is. But not one of those books actually had pure spree killers. They had a mix of serial sprees and mass killers. So this book, the book that we've put out, this it's really a textbook, does a couple of things. It's pure spree killers. It's well defined. It gives the history of how we came, you know, how this definition came to be and how, how the FBI came to eliminate it in 2005. And then every single case, all 419 killers, we have a summary of every case. So we list who it was, how old they were, where did it occur, how many victims were killed, how many victims were wounded, how long was the spree, what was the weapon, and other dynamics that we collected. So it's really a good like reference, you know, if you're ever looking up any of these kinds of killers. But for law enforcement, I think the most important thing is that you recognize that we have categorized spree killers now. And if you can discern which category you're dealing with, much like they did in Phoenix um, with, with Jones, you can intervene, which is what they did. You can stop future victims from being killed or targeted or wounded, and you can identify the killer and oftentimes locate them and, and stop them, arrest them, or, or, you know, some of them, a lot of them suicide. But, uh, you know, you, you can be proactive, which is, but we're not proactive in mass murder, and we're not really proactive in serial killers. So that's really the interesting dynamic that we never explored when we started looking at spree killers. And that's, that's what we've done in the book. So it's, I think it's really helpful. I'm here with Mark Safrick, uh, retired uh, supervisory special agent from the FBI, uh, also spent half of his uh, illustrious career in the behavioral science unit supervising that unit. Uh, that's where we became friends. And uh, I think at that time I was actually working with uh, Cooper. We were working on a study for uh, the Department of Justice on serial killers who select uh, elderly women as their preferential victim, and that's where we kind of struck up our friendship. But, but uh, Mark, I'm I'm really intrigued by this idea of changing the classification system, and I wonder when you have rolled out now with this new reclassification and clarification, how has the bureau accepted that? Well, the problem is, you know, right after the book was released, COVID hit. So, you know, <laughs> I have a, all my training and lecturing uh, things have been canceled. My presentations were all canceled, you know, presenting at the American Academy of Forensic Science. That was canceled. So, yeah, it's uh, I've been I've done some remote uh, presentations on it, but hopefully, you know, we're going to get the bureau back in and looking at this dynamic. In fact, I just uh, I just uh, had breakfast with John Jarvis who is uh, one of the uh, administrators over at the FBI Academy, and we were discussing this problem. So I, yeah, I, I would like to see the FBI address this and bring this back. Um, I mean, other researchers still use the terminology, but you know, different people have different definitions of spree. We'd like to sort of standardize that definition because it is very close to what we originally had, but it does stand on its own now. and. It, and you can look at cases, and some of them will slide very close to uh, mass mass murders, uh, and others will slide very close to serial killers, like Andrew Cunanan. Like his spree, most people think of him as a serial killer, but actually he's really a spree killer. But his spree went over almost like a month, uh, or or 
longer, which is unusual for a spree, but he was on the run the whole time. So it's just, you know, you look at Anders Breivik, most people think of him as a, as a, uh, you know, as a mass murderer, but really he's got, he's a, he's a spree crossover. And we tried, so a lot of the cases we go, well, it could fit here or it could fit in this category. What we try to do is what is the best fit? Where does this really belong? You know, that's, and that's how we place the case. Sometimes yeah. we had uh, cases that were crossovers like Brenton Tarrant. So Brenton Tarrant was a spree killer in Christ Church, New Zealand, who went on a killing spree for about 36 minutes. And thankfully, the police were really good about monitoring the live video feeds that he was putting out and his manifesto, which was really railing against Muslims because he started attacking, you know, the uh, Muslim locations, Muslim churches, uh, and was killing people there. So his spree was very short lived. He killed a lot of people, though. I think it was like 59 people and a bunch yeah. of people wounded. But um, he's really a mass spree crossover, right? But because he was posting his manifesto and live, he was live streaming his movement and killing that police got onto him and actually were able to intercept him before he got to another, um, be got, before he got to another location to do any more killing. That was really a remarkable case. And I think you, you know, I was actually in Christchurch when you that were, happened, yeah. uh, meeting with the police commissioner. And uh, it was it was really impressive. Not, I, I think we, we sometimes drop the ball when it comes to uh, monitoring social media and trying to really keep track of someone like that. And I think that was a win for them there. We have probably too many failures where we uh, learn later law enforcement knew that there was a concern. And, and yet the problem is, how, how do you really respond to a concern when we promise you can have free speech and all these freedoms that we give? Right. Well, the, the Jason Dalton case, the Uber driver who killed like six people is a great example because the first guy he didn't he was picking up people all night, but he wasn't killing everybody. He was only killing some and one. The first guy that he picked up, he was acting incredibly erratic, you know, and this guy reported this uh, Dalton to the police, but the police didn't do anything with it. If they had, you know, followed up. They probably could have stopped all the killings, but they didn't. And, uh, you know, and Dalton went on over the night to kill a number of people. So, yeah, I think recognizing that, you know, that we do have spree killers, what they are, and that we have the ability to categorize them, and that there is a way to, for us to get in front of these cases, you know, through monitoring social media, through looking at victimization, looking at people's Instagram, Facebook posts, and their history, because usually in their social media history, you're going to find discussions or comments about individuals, especially in the anger, revenge targeted category, that will be helpful. Plus, you want to interview coworkers and neighbors and family members, because they're typically going to have some information that they can share with you. So getting on top of that if you think you're dealing with an anger revenge killer is going to be really important and not important if you're dealing with you know a, a mental illness or desperation or robbery thrill killer it's not going to be helpful so recognizing when you can intervene um and i mean uh, in christchurch that case we would have had well over a hundred victims that oh, had been yeah. killed if if the police hadn't been as proactive as they as they were because they really stopped that spree in short order because he was on his way to uh another location uh, to to target more muslims yeah and i mean you think about that that planning from his perspective to hit quickly and then move to the next how disorienting that can be for law enforcement because of such a huge demand at that first mosque. This is this is a guy who had, if I remember right, he had six or eight uh, weapons. Many of those yeah. were were uh, semi-automatic assault weapons. 
you know, I, I wondered how does he how does he even get all those guns from Australia over to New Zealand without somebody saying, "Wait a minute, do you really need this many guns on your hunting trip?" Yeah, I, yeah, that it was an area we didn't really address. You know how they got their weapons. Of course, for for these killers, firearms are the are the largest number of weapons. Most of them are handguns, um, followed you know way down the list by edged weapons. Uh, and then actually a mix of edged weapons and firearms. But m- most of the firearms are handguns uh, or some, t- some other type of firearm. I think 75% of the murders were done with firearms. So, yeah, it's, it's, you know, I mean, that's the greatest way to kill the, the most people. Yeah. So, Mark, on the, on the, let's say the synagogue in uh, Pennsylvania when it was struck a few years ago, uh, mass or spree? Um. Uh, probably mass. That's what uh, I, I would think. say. Is mass. Because you have to have at least two locations. You have to have at least two locations. So that was, you know, that was one of the problems is that Spree really, it resembles serial in that you have multiple locations and it resembles mass because you've got multiple victims, right? So that's why, you know, when you eliminate that terminology, like you're basically left with mass or spree, but there are cases, lots of cases, that don't fall into those two categories. We we need to have that category. Uh, now we have a one of our subcategories is a is a category called movement in tight locations, and it's really meant to address those kinds of issues, like uh, paddock in in uh, in Las Vegas. So. When we talk about mass murder, we're talking about four or more victims. And of course, in mass murder, we typically have many more than that. Uh, and, we're, and the other thing that I should also point out, point out in the book is that we do not include family annihilation cases in, these, in, this, in the book. Now, family members can target other family members, but not like the John List case where you have, you know, all family members killed at the, at one location we didn't we didn't include family annihilations he was really confined huge number of victims confined to a single location but could right. he have become a spree killer of course so the the movement in tight locations the way that we define it is that let's say you have a killer who goes who's targeting a business say he got fired from right so he goes to this business and it's located in several buildings. He goes to the business, he kills the security guard outside so he can take the tag to gain entry into the building. He goes into the building, so now he's killed one out front. He goes into the building, nobody in the building's aware of the security guard being killed. He goes in, goes on the first floor, kills uh, two co-workers that, you know, that had, all, had turned him in or you know, said he wasn't a very good worker. Then he goes up to the fourth floor and he kills his supervisor up there. Now the supervisor wasn't aware of the of the two being killed down on the first floor. And then he goes to the stairwell and he goes down the stairwell out the back, goes across the street and he shoots a guy sitting on a park bench. This is actually one of the cases that we have. Now, none of those victims were aware of prior victims and that's kind of how we look at the movement in tight locations. They're almost always on foot but they're moving from one location to another where future victims weren't aware of the prior victims, but it's all really in a small area. So a guy could go from, in a neighborhood, he could go from one house to another house to another house, right, in the same neighborhood, or multiple buildings in a cluster of buildings. But typically it's tightly, it's tightly uh, you know, grouped geographically, as opposed to say, a, a school shooter who goes into the school, he starts shooting people. Now, immediately, everybody in the school is aware that there's a shooter. So he goes into one classroom, he kills you know, a number of students, then he goes down the hall to another classroom and kills more students. That we would just call a mass murder. He's not really going anywhere. Um, he's in really very close proximity and everybody is aware once the shooting starts, what's going on. And that's, that's how we differentiate between those. But the movement in tight locations category, which is of fairly good size, is not included in the data analytics. 
So, so the, the subcategories that we had of mixed and movement in tight locations were not included in our analysis. Uh, only the only the five primary categories. So that is helpful. I, I'll tell you what, I, f- I feel like I'm sitting in a classroom right now and I've got so many questions, but um, it, I, I, here, here's, I'm going to throw a little goofy twist uh, to this. Um, can a serial killer also be a spree killer? And I'm going to preface it with this question. I, I'm thinking, I've been thinking as you just were talking about Robert Ben Rhodes, who on multiple occasions picked up uh, a couple traveling together, quickly executes the boy so that he can keep his preferential, obviously, victim and torture them for weeks. Spree killer or serial killer? No, he's a serial killer. Rhodes is a serial killer because he's, he's the, the male victims that, of Rhodes were just simply eliminated. They were just in the way. And they were just, you know, eliminated so he could interact with the females. But yeah, Rhodes is clearly a serial killer. We have a chapter called uh, Spree Crossovers. So they're uh, about uh, maybe 8% of the cases that we have, or maybe it's smaller. I'm not sure exactly. Uh, So you have Spree Mass, Spree Serial, and we actually even have a Spree Mass Serial. So you have a guy who's actually a serial engaged in serial killing, mass killing, and spree killing, um, but it's they're pretty rare. And those cases were also not included in our in our uh, data analysis. So, yeah, they're interesting cases. I mean, Brevik is a case like that. The, uh, the uh, Brenton Tarrant is a spree crossover, so he's spree mass. Um, and, and and there's other the um, the killing in Australia. Uh, the guy's name escapes me. Uh, Port Arthur, the Port Arthur massacre. Most people think of that as a mass murder, but really he's a spree killer because he started his killing in the guest cottage, killing the two owners of the guest cottage, and then moved to the cafe out at the at the tourist area where he killed a whole bunch of people in like 36 seconds. And then he left there and he was shooting people on the way back, took a hostage, then went back to the... Um, to the guest cottage and then kill the hostage. So, I mean, overall, when you think of, of that case, you think of mass, but he's really, he, he really is by definition a spree killer, but he would fall into that spree crossover. So, and so, and when they didn't really fit into like a, a really good category, like the anger, revenge or desperation or robbery thrill or a uh, mission psychotic or non-psychotic, and they exhibited, you know, aspects of both spree and either serial or mass. We just put them into the spree crossover because they they didn't show enough uh, motivation or, uh, you know, the, the drive for the crime, that precipitating event that then fuels the rest of the of the spree. They didn't show a strong enough, um, you know, motive that they we could take them and put them actually into one of the other categories. Yeah. So now we're we're kind of rolling up to the tail end of COVID where our hopes and dreams are this thing is over. How yeah. do you roll this out and get this into the hands of law enforcement so that they can start to classify these in hopes of moving more quickly and more nimbly in resolving these kinds of cases as they're as they're evolving? Well, two I think two ways. One is, you know, at, at all these large conferences, homicide conferences, or American Academy of Forensic Science, where you have lots of law enforcement and other groups, um, th- there's always book vendors, and they all of the books from these different, um, you know, vendors, CRC Press and Wiley, and all these, their books are there, and that's one location where police or law enforcement will be exposed to this. The other is then simply doing presentations, like I've. I've done a a, a very small presentation at American Academy of Forensic Science uh, in 2020, but um, it was just a, you know, we hadn't had in 20, excuse me, 2019, we hadn't had all the data really established yet. So doing presentations for law enforcement groups, getting that information out there and having the book available at, you know, law enforcement conferences and, 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 just having discussions like I'm doing uh, 
of, of presentation in next month in Berkeley, uh, virtual presentation. So it will be a lot of law enforcement there. So the more we talk about this and, and bring it forward, but I think it'll take some time, right? I just think, um, you know, it's, it's a textbook, so it isn't, you know, it's not going to be on the New York Times bestseller list, right? Um, but, it, it, but, but it's a great no, but it, it does need to be in the hands of 870,000 police officers in America and globally an right. unknown number of police officers it, it and, uh, and, and uh, psychologists and others. Uh, Mark Safrick, how do people get a hold of you, Mark, if they want to use you in their next conference, whether it's digital and online, or as we start rolling and looking toward the second half of the year when we can actually start getting together again? How do they contact you? Sure. Uh, either through the website, fbsinternational.com, uh, or Mark Safrick at fbs, msafrick at fbsinternational.com is an email address. Yeah. That's great. I, I'll tell you, folks, I have. I hope you have been as enthralled as I have as, I, as we listen to Special Agent uh, Mark Safrick. Mark and I uh, go back quite some time, I think now 15 years or more, and oh, yeah. uh, how no, much I've appreciated. Like, you know, Is it longer? <laughs> You did say something I thought was really interesting because I've used this. I've said this at my conferences because, you know, you have a conference. Like I spoke at the California Homicide Investigators Association, which is like 800 homicide guys. Right. And so you have an FBI agent coming in, like from the profiling unit uh, to speak. And, you know, there's a lot of guys that go, oh, you know, FBI. Right. You know, but I always said, look, I was a cop for seven years before I was an agent. I was working homicides. I was a violent crime investigator. I worked patrol on the street. So I always started off by describing myself as an FBI agent with a cop's mentality, right? That's the <laughs> way. And then, you know, you win cops over that way because like you, yeah. I've been in those shoes. I've worked patrol on midnight sh shift. I've investigated homicides and double homicides. So I know what that's like. And in fact, that's it was going to a homicide school in California, two week school, where we got a couple of FBI profilers, Roy Hazelwood and, and uh, Russ Vorpagel, you remember, um, that gave a presentation on something I'd never heard of before. And for me, it was such a fascinating way of looking at um, complex violent crime cases that I had never considered or even heard of. And it, that's what drove my interest and I started submitting some of my homicide cases to the FBI for analysis, right? Yeah. And then I just after about a year of doing this, I'm just like, I realized like, that's what I really want to do. I want to, I want to do that kind of analysis, become an FBI profiler. And it took me a year to get into the bureau. And then it took me 11 years to get into the unit. So, you know, and that's, then I stayed. That's amazing though. Career, and uh, I loved it. And, and now I've been out almost 14 and I still am doing the same type of work still, you know, that, that you mentioned the elderly uh, serial killers, but you know, I've done a tremendous amount of research on sexual homicides of elderly women, published quite a few articles in this area and book chapters. And, you know, you know that there's was no research in this area uh, none, when none. I started this back in 96. Nobody had looked at, we'd looked at serial uh, sexual homicide offenders but nobody that had looked at just those that target women, you know, 60 years of age and older. Um, so it was a new area of, that got research and you were looking at it in terms of serial killers. And I was looking at it in terms of serial killers and sexual homicide offenders and juvenile sexual homicide offenders. Yeah, and, and it, it, you open up new avenues of research that we hadn't done before. And I think that's what we've, Catherine and I have done with this uh, with spree killers is brought this terminology back into the law enforcement lexicon to use define and uh, you know to have as a reference well I wish more law enforcement would grasp on to what profiling and behavioral analysis could do for their cases for me it was the, such an aha moment and and caused me to just want to learn more about this art and science of profiling and and it literally changed the way I investigated cases as I started oh, cool. to understand those principles and and uh, 
and to you and and to Coop and to to uh, Douglas and Wrestler and uh, I, I, Art Meister. I, I mean, I just I just keep wanting to just say how much that has meant because it's helped me become better at the craft during the years that I had to do it, and now as an armchair. Uh, investigator to be able to provide insight and thought and uh, if more officers could get past this idea that it's voodoo witchcraft and that it's about systematic investigations i think we could turn cases around much more quickly i think it's you know it's for use in specific types of cases not all cases are amenable to using behavioral analysis but your more complex, unusual homicide cases with multiple offenders or multiple victims or a lot of time spent at the scene or just really, you know, dynamics you don't understand uh, can be very useful for, for law enforcement. And I think when I lecture about this, I'm really trying to educate them, like, what is the process that we're using? What is it that we're actually doing here? Because they don't really know. Right. And and. It's really important on cases that are that cops don't understand. I mean, I've done a number of cases for big agencies, San Francisco PD, Chicago PD, LAPD's robbery homicide unit. Those guys are top notch in homicides. But every once in a while, you get these really unusual cases that that can lend themselves, especially uh, in terms of a prosecution or moving the case forward you know, from a behavioral understanding of what's really going on here and how do you integrate the forensic science, the physical evidence and the behavioral evidence into a cogent understanding of the dynamics of the crime. What is the totality of these events? How do we tell the story of this crime, you know, or of this death? so that it makes sense so that you get you understand what happened how things occurred and importantly why and that's the dynamic of that and uh you know the every time i lecture you know especially if i'm talking about the research or i'm talking about the process you know cops come up you know they go you know i didn't really understand what that that really was and you know profiling on tv and various tv shows is you know, it's shown sometimes as, you know, sort of this, they can do everything and, and we can't do everything. And there's a number of cases that aren't really good cases for <laughs> this type of analysis. Yeah. But the more difficult, the more complex, the more unusual the case, the better it is for getting. And, you know, it's a specific type of analysis. So a lot of cases can, can lend themselves to that that type of uh, of review, in-depth review. Uh, oh, oh, that you could get to the point that you could solve a crime in in forty minutes plus commercials, Safrick. That's yeah, and run the DNA, right? And run <laughs> that's the true. Right? Oh. That's true. Yeah. Well, or uh, get folks, prints off of things we can never, rarely ever get prints off of, you know. So yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> well, folks, we've been talking to Mark Safrick, supervisory special agent, retired from the FBI and unit chief over the behavioral analysis unit there, the profiling unit. We've been talking about spree killers, and I hope that you'll go out and check and buy his book, Spree Killers, Practical Classifications for Law Enforcement and Criminology. It's co-authored by Catherine Ramsland, and uh, it really is a book worthy of having, even if you're not in the law enforcement profession, because it's built for law enforcement officers, but it will help you understand these interesting dynamics associated with this. Mark, thank you so much. Would you come back again and we'll cover some other topics? No, sure. I'd love to, Mike. I, I love talking about this stuff. You know, it's, just, it's my life. <laughs> so absolutely. And thanks for having me on. I really, uh, really enjoyed, uh, you know, talking with you today, or actually I did most of the talking, but you know, that's what happens when I, I mean, I just I'm very interested in this in this stuff so well isn't that what we always isn't that what we always try to teach investigators is just get them get them talking and then just keep writing notes like crazy so yeah absolutely no i really appreciate you (laughs) and good seeing you again i know we talk occasionally by email but but good to see you and uh thanks for having me on profile yeah really good to see you i hope your family's well and we'll talk soon everyone's good thanks mike 
Thanks for listening to the Profiling Evil podcast. If you enjoyed the show, don't forget to rate us and review us wherever you get your podcasts. And please, don't forget to go to our YouTube channel where you can watch some of the hundreds of videos we've created. Now, if you're looking for a great crime story, check out my new book, Deceived, an investigative memoir of the Zion Society cult. You can find it at profilingevil.com. While you're there, you can also sign up for our elite newsletter, the Bolo. I'm Mike King and thanks for listening.